Hello and welcome again to ID the Future. I'm Casey Luskin broadcasting with Dr. Stephen Meyer from Redmond, Washington about his forthcoming book, Darwin's Doubt, The Explosive Origin of Animal Life and the Case for Intelligent Design. In the previous podcast, Dr. Meyer, we talked about how these materialistic theories of evolution, whether we're talking about neo-Darwinism or these post-Darwinian models, they fail to account for the origin of both genetic and epigenetic information that are necessary to explain the origin of animal body plans. But of course, there's another model that's really important that's out there. It's a, it's a viable scientific hypothesis that we haven't talked about yet, and that is, of course, intelligent design. So I'd like to get into that topic in this Eye to the Future podcast. So to put it bluntly, how does the Cambrian explosion make an argument for intelligent design, or why is intelligent design the best explanation for the Cambrian explosion? Well, a lot of people have a real hard time getting their head around that transition. And many readers, I think, will go with me as far as the critique of these various materialistic evolutionary theories, right, up to many of the more current ones, which have, as I said, some great virtues, but also an overriding problem with all of these models is their inability to explain the origin of information. By that, I mean the kind of functional or what I call specified information that's present in living systems, both genetic and epigenetic. And what I do in the book is I first take a little step back and ask people to think about how we reason about the historical past, in particular, how we do it in the natural sciences. And I take an excursus into what is, in fact, Darwinian reasoning, the kind of reasoning that he used in The Origin of Species, and the kind of reasoning that he got from one of his key mentors, Charles Lyell, the great geologist, who developed this method of historical scientific reasoning that is sometimes called uniformitarian reasoning, and which provided the foundation of a systematic method of scientific reasoning called the method of multiple competing hypotheses, sometimes by philosophers called the method of inference to the best explanation. And the early scientists in the 19th century, the early historical scientists, generated some very clear criteria for what constituted a best explanation. If you had a number of competing hypotheses, how did you assess which one was offering the best explanation of the data and therefore should be elected as the one to prefer? And the criterion that was most important that they came to was something called causal adequacy. Or Lyell put it this way, he said that when we're reconstructing events in the remote past, we should be looking for causes now in operation, causes that we know from our present experience of cause and effect to be sufficient to produce the effect in question. And I found this same criterion at work in Darwin's thinking and in his work. He was trying to show that his theory provided what he called a vera causa, a true cause, a cause known to produce the effect in question. So here's how the reasoning works. If you're trying to explain, for example, the layer of volcanic ash that we find over in eastern Washington, and you weren't around on May 18th, 1980 to see the volcano erupt, you're going to have to reason from that effect back to the prior causes. And so you're going to think of a number of possible explanations, a number of competing hypotheses. You, you might propose an earthquake, you might propose a flood, you might propose a volcanic eruption. Now, which one of those three is best? Well, obviously, the volcanic eruption is the best explanation in that case because we have experience and we have made observations of volcanoes leaving that kind of an effect. There's a cause and effect relationship that's been established in the present in our experience. We haven't seen floods or earthquakes produce layers of white ash in the same way. And so when we encounter the ash, absent observational experience of the cause, we can still infer the cause from the effect because we know of only one kind of cause which is sufficient to produce the effect in question. So I, in my grad school years in Cambridge, got very immersed in studying this method of historical scientific reasoning. And it applies beautifully to the question of the Cambrian. And in fact, it's precisely this requirement that we should be looking for causes which are known from our present experience to have the capacity mm -hmm. to produce the effect in question that leads inexorably to the design inference. Because if one of the key effects of the Cambrian and I look at seven key features of the Cambrian explosion, but I start with the question of the origin of information. I think it's fundamental. If that is the fundamental effect that has to be explained, the fundamental feature of the Cambrian explosion, and we ask ourselves the question, what do we know from experience that is capable of producing functional information, indeed in a digital form as we find it in genes, we immediately, if we have open minds, come to the realization that there is a cause of which we know that is capable of producing that kind of an effect, and that is intelligence. It's mind, not an undirected or mindless material process, 
but minds are capable of creating information, and nothing else we know of is. And so when we find that distinctive effect of intelligent causes, of conscious activity, as one information scientist put it, an information scientist named Henry Quassler, whom I love to quote, he was an early pioneer in the application of information theory to molecular biology. He said that the creation of information is habitually associated with conscious activity. He was almost citing the, the Lyellian dictum to look for causes now in operation. What we know from our uniform and repeated experience from what we see habitually is that conscious and rational activity generates information. So when we find information, absent direct observational knowledge of its cause, of its origin, we can still infer backwards in time to that cause because we know only one other cause which is sufficient to produce that key effect. And so what I do in the book is I develop the method of historical scientific reasoning first, and then I show how it applies to the problem of the Cambrian information explosion, the origin of the information, both genetic and epigenetic. And then I infer or argue that an intelligent cause, a conscious rational agency, is the best explanation for the kind of effect that we're seeing in the Cambrian. And then I also apply it to the Cambrian in other ways, because there are six or seven other fascinating aspects of the Cambrian explosion that I think also are kind of telltale indicators of the activity of mind. The way that I see this argument structure, Dr. Meyer, and you might, I'm sure you agree with this. I probably got this idea from reading your book. An intelligent design is just another one of these post-Darwinian models that's out there competing to explain where animal form and information comes from. We know that neo-Darwinian theory is failing. I mean, that's been acknowledged by all, as you said, but the most strident neo-Darwinists, Jerry Coyne, maybe. You know, there's just a few real hardcore holdouts left. But as far as where we're at today, there's a lot of models on the table. Why can't intelligent design be one of these models on the table? I see no reason. I mean, obviously, as you just presented the argument, it is a cause capable of explaining the observed evidence, the observed data that we see using scientific principles of reasoning. So why can't ID be on the table for it, this post opening world? A, it's a scientific argument in the following senses. It's based on scientific evidence. It uses an established method of scientific reasoning. And it's in theoretical competition with other scientific theories that are attempting to explain the same phenomena. And I argue that it explains them best, where best has a clear set of criteria for its definition, and that is, in particular, the importance of causal adequacy. And intelligent agency is the only known cause of several such features in the Cambrian event. Not only the digital information, but the hierarchical organization of information and many other features of both the fossil record and the organisms that first appear, which I spell out. So in the book, I make the case that ID is the best explanation, but then I address the question you're asking. Why is it that many scientists want to exclude it from consideration? And there we get into really an unspoken convention. Sometimes it's spoken, but often unspoken convention in the natural sciences that says that if you're going to be a scientist, you must not seek the best explanation, no holds barred, you must seek the best materialistic explanation. You must limit yourself to only materialistic kinds of causes. And I show that uh, that convention is really unfounded, that in bottom, it's anti-intellectual mm -hmm. because it limits the freedom of the scientist to follow the evidence where it most naturally leads. One of the things that I show in the book is that not only the Cambrian animals, but the pattern of fossil appearance looks just as we would expect it to look if, in fact, an intelligent agent had acted. That many of the distinguishing features, the hallmarks of the Cambrian event, are features which are known from experience to be produced by one and only one type of cause that causes intelligent agency, conscious, rational deliberation. And so if we are simply willing to open our minds to that possibility, we find that we do have a very compelling explanation for features that are otherwise completely inexplicable, not only on neo-Darwinian grounds, but also in relation to some of these newer materialistic evolutionary theories. Hmm. You mentioned the critics of intelligent design that try to exclude ID from consideration by fiat, by defining it out of science. Let's talk about the critics for just a minute. Your previous book, Signature in the Cell, which made the case for intelligent design and the origin of life and the origin of the first information required for life. How did the critics respond to that book? And what did you learn from that experience of, of never responding to Signature? Well, there were two types of responses, oddly. One was there were reviews that gave no evidence of having read the book. And one I don't mind singling out by name. It was the review of Francisco Ayala, who got the title of the book wrong, 
the argument of the book wrong and the topic of the book wrong. And later claimed that he did read the book, but I think any objective observer who read that first review and compared it to what the book actually said could not have come to the conclusion that he read it in any detail if he read it at all. So that was one kind of review. Another kind of review was curious in a different way. And some of these reviews did give evidence of having read the book, but they still responded to the book as if it was saying something different than it was actually saying. Many of the reviews tried to critique the book by saying that there was lots of evidence that the neo-Darwinian mechanism of natural selection and random mutation could generate new information. While that might be a response that people want to make to the new book, and I welcome those responses because I think we have a good argument against that idea, it wasn't an argument of the first book. The first book was about the origin of the information necessary to produce the first life. And since the mutation selection mechanism is not operative, it's not a force to be reckoned with until you have organisms capable of differential self-reproduction, invoking the mutation selection mechanism as an explanation for the origin of the first life is really a non-starter. Now, there's some ways to try to get around that, but most of the reviews were giving examples of information generation, usually very modest amounts of information generation, that would have occurred in the history of life long after the origin of the first life, and so really weren't relevant to the thesis of that book. You mentioned critics who would respond without seemingly having read your book. And it's interesting. We're sitting here today. I don't think that your book is actually going to be released for maybe a couple months at this point. And we're already seeing people attacking Darwin's Doubt, and they couldn't possibly have read it. So we're seeing maybe a similar trend. Again, people are attacking your book when we know they haven't read it. What do you anticipate is going to be the response to Darwin's Doubt? And do you have any thoughts on that? Well, I really don't like speculate about things like that. But I do think it's very curious that two and a half months before the (laughs) pub date and the release of the book, that we already have people critiquing what they presume the book will say. Um, One member of the Scottish Skeptic Society commended to me his concern, what he said, just because Darwin had a doubt about his theory in 1859 doesn't make it false today, as if Perhaps I had argued that. Um, I can reassure this critic that that isn't. Well, what you I, know, that, that's not. That's not what I argued. You have a so. couple footnotes post 1859. I think. I, I, well, there are a couple. There's yeah. a couple. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, yeah, I do think it's a kind of curious phenomenon, and I would say I think it betrays not intellectual confidence among people who are defending standard neo-Darwinism or even other materialistic evolutionary theories. I think it shows a little hypersensitivity. And Mm -hmm. I think it would behoove us all to wait until the book comes out and then we'll have a, a spirited and friendly, I hope, a friendly and open discussion, debate, and conversation about the thesis of the book. I think you're right. I think there is some, some hypersensitivity being shown in this rush to judgment about your book. Well, I kind of wonder, what what are they so afraid of? Let's let's wait until it yeah, comes out. Yeah. You know? I mean, one of these uh, evolution bloggers was attacking me for writing an, an article on evolution news about your book because it's not fair. He hasn't had a chance to read the book yet, and so I shouldn't be talking about it yet. Well, well, I read the book, so I, I think I have the right to talk about it. And he has every right to talk about it once he reads the book, but why Why the concern that he's losing this argument? Well, I do think that perceptive evolutionary biologists know that the Cambrian explosion is a huge problem. Yeah. It hasn't been solved. And really, the story of the book is the progressive deepening of the mystery that Darwin first identified, and that this very small and seemingly isolated anomaly that Darwin recognized in 1859 has grown up to be indicative or illustrative of a major and fundamental problem with all of evolutionary theory, and that is the problem of the origin of form and the deeper problem of the origin of information. And I think there's some very good evolutionary biologists who have made very candid statements about the problems with neo-Darwinian theory, about the fact that we are are in a post-neo-Darwinian world. Eugene Koonin, who's very skeptical of neo-Darwinism, says we're in a kind of a post-modern post-neo-Darwinian world in the sense that there's a whole slew of different proposals and none of them are really solving the problem. At least that's my reading of what Kuna means by a postmodern situation. There's no clear alternative to neo-Darwinism that's been put forward. Of course, these internet critics are just fun to joke about. I think actually there's something much more serious here, as you say. And I think that thoughtful critics, not the ones we're kind of poking fun at, thoughtful critics are going to see your argument. And I think it's going to be very compelling. So I I look forward to conversations with people like this. And I'm having some already offline, if you will, Mm. with some very serious leading biologists who recognize some of the same problems that are highlighted in the book. There's a terrific book out this year by Irwin and Valentine on the Cambrian explosion. And they identify many of the same problems in their book that I do in mine. They obviously are not proponents of intelligent design, but they are acknowledging 
In fact, that there are no known biological processes that produce the kind of change that is evident in the Cambrian fossil record. They take what they call a, a non-uniformitarian evolutionary approach, that they're looking for some kind of cause or mechanism that's unlike anything we see at work today. That's how dramatic the event was and how mysterious it is from a standard Darwinian point of view. Well, Dr. Meyer, thank you so much for your time and for sharing with ID the Future listeners about your exciting new book, Darwin's Doubt. It's available on Amazon.com as well as you can go to darwinsdoubt.com, order it in advance, I believe. Well, I think all good people at the Discovery Office have arranged for some kind of special deal if you pre-order it off of the Darwin's Doubt website. You get you get some ebooks, yeah. It's four ebooks or yeah. something, you know. But wait, folks, there's more. You know? <laughs> anyway, yeah. So Darwin's Doubt is a good place to go to get a good deal. I Great. Darwinsdoubt.com. Thank you so much for your time, Dr. Meyer, and for writing this book. I think it's going to be another landmark for the ID movement. And we look forward to seeing the difference that it makes in the years to come in this debate. So thank you. Thank you, Casey. Great discussion. I'm Casey Luskin with ID the Future. Stay tuned for more on Darwin's Doubt. Thanks for listening. This program was recorded by Discovery Institute Center for Science and Culture. ID the Future is copyright Discovery Institute 2013. For more information, visit www.intelligentdesign.org or www.idthefuture.com.